Massachusetts. <laughs> President Spilka, Speaker Mariano, Leader Tarr, Leader Jones, members of the Senate and the House, Secretary Galvin, Attorney General Campbell, Treasurer Goldberg, Otter Desaglio, Chief Justice Budd, and members of the Judiciary and the Governor's Council. Governor Dukakis, Governor Swift. Good to see you here. It's also good to see Governor Swift and 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 Mayor. <laughs> Mayor Wu, mayors and local officials. <laughs> A rowdy bunch. Leaders from business and labor, clergy and guests, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you as well to my partner, Joanna Lidgate, the Commonwealth's first first partner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all of your love and support. And thank you to my family for all that you've given to me. <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Kim. <laughs> great year. It's been so special to work with you. Your knowledge of local issues is unmatched and your care and compassion for our residents is unbounded. Plus, she's got a pretty great selfie game. <laughs> <laughs> to the cabinet and executive staff, we should take a selfie for this do one. Do we do things a little differently. Yeah. No, with the gang. With the gang, this with one. The gang. Get ready, small. Forgive us, we're rookies. <laughs> to our cabinet and executive staff, you are the best teammates we could ever, ever have. Thank you. <laughs> to our state employees in this chamber and out there tonight, I want you to know that I know that nothing gets done, nothing that we talk about tonight gets done without all of you, and I thank you. <laughs> to our service members and Gold Star families, know that your sacrifice is never forgotten. At this this moment, and at this moment, it's been a year. It's been a year of a lot of loss and heartache for Massachusetts military families. I just want to invite all military families and veterans who are with us tonight in the chamber to stand. We thank you. To 
the people of Massachusetts, those here tonight and those watching at home, thank you for welcoming me into your communities throughout this year, welcoming us in to celebrate wins and grieve losses, to share your struggles and your hopes. Through it all, what I've seen more deeply than ever before, more deeply than I ever understood, was that the true strength of this great state is our people. So I want to introduce a few of them tonight. We have with us Jay and Lisa Savage. Jay and Lisa. Jay. Oh, wait till you hear about him. <laughs> Jay is a fourth generation potato farmer from Deerfield. God bless you. But I want to tell you something. You see, back in July, on a hot and humid day, we waded together through muds, covering fields. The water was knee deep. We then went on to see hundreds of acres that were absolutely destroyed by flooding, the reality of climate change today. In Western and Central Massachusetts, I stood with families like the savages who were staring down the total and complete loss of their crops just before the harvest. But they kept working hard as they always do, and our state rallied around them. We asked the legislature for help, and you delivered. We set up a fund with the United Way, and donors large and small contributed what they could. And today, every single one of those farms and farmers are still on their feet. Jay and Lisa, thank you for all you do, and thank you to all of those folks who work so hard to put food on our table. Also with us tonight is Danita Menz. Now, Danita is a mom from Roxbury. She was without a degree, and she found herself hitting career ceilings. She enrolled in a certificate program. She wanted to pursue her passion for interior design. But as a working mom, she was struggling to buy groceries, to pay bills, to pay tuition. She was going to drop out. We know there are thousands of people in our state like Danita. That's why this year we worked closely with the legislature and we did something special. We created Mass Reconnect. It's a program, it's a program that offers free community college to anyone 25 years or older. For Danita, it came just in time. With the barrier of cost now removed, she's now going for her degree at Mass Bay Community College. She calls it... <laughs> Danita, Danita calls it life-changing. And you know what she says? She says she can now talk to her little guy, her little son, Otis, about the importance of education because she is living it. That's generational impact. Danita, your future is bright. And Otis, you may not understand it today, but you will, and you will be so proud of your mom. You know what's also great about that program that we did together? Public enrollment in higher education is up for the first time in 10 years in this state. That's a really good thing for our students, for employers who are going to benefit from a more skilled workforce and for our economy, so I thank you. A year ago, you put your trust in us, and we've worked hard every day to try to live up to that responsibility. The whole way we've been guided by this simple truth. 
that behind every decision we make is a student, a family, a business owner, a senior. That's who we work for. Yes, our economy is strong. Massachusetts has more jobs than ever before, and unemployment is at an all-time low. But we also know that prices are high, and too many families are having a hard time making ends meet. Many of us understand what that's like. I, um, I think of my own mom, uh, raising five of us kids alone. One night, I remember years ago, we were sitting around the kitchen table, and I could see she was hiding tears. She picked up her head and softly asked my little brother if she could use his savings from yard work and babysitting to pay taxes. He was 11. You do what you have to do. People do what they have to do. I understand that. And as I see it, government should be there to make life easier, not harder. So, so you know this. You know this, and I want the people at home to know this. That's why we were determined to deliver relief from high costs. The legislature shared that goal. We worked together. We kept at it. And we passed a billion-dollar tax cut this year that will save money for everyone in this state. That's right. We cut taxes for the first time in 20 years in Massachusetts. You will see the savings when you file your returns in April. We now have the most generous child and, and child and dependent tax credit of any state in the country. And we also got rid of the two-child cap. For someone like my mom, the extra $2,200 would have meant something. For every family with a child or an adult with disabilities, you're going to get dollars back to help you pay for groceries, utilities, gas, and housing. Renters and commuters will also get more money back, as will folks dealing with lead paint and septic systems. <laughs> families, families will be able to pass on more of their hard-earned money because we also cut the estate tax. Businesses will save money when they start here, stay here, grow here and our seniors will benefit as well. With us tonight is Elaine Correa. Elaine is 87 years old, God bless you, a retired nurse, still active in her community. Let me tell you about Elaine. <laughs> Let me tell you about Elaine. Elaine has lived in her home in New Bedford for 61 years. She calls it a blessing every day. She also has nine grandkids, and she told me they don't all agree on politics. But her home is the neutral home where they all love to gather. She loves their visits. At the same time, it's not easy for Elaine to buy groceries or pay the heating bill. Elaine, it's stories like yours that inspired us to double the senior housing credit to $2,400 because no one should have to worry if they can afford to stay in the house that they love. I want to thank the legislature for your partnership in making Massachusetts more affordable. And tax cuts were just the start. We also made school meals, both breakfast and lunch, free for all students. That's
I'm grateful to the speaker for his leadership and his passion on this issue. We were together. Let me tell you something. He loves the attention. You know, before he was speaker, he, he, he had another gig. He was a teacher. And we went back to Snug Harbor Elementary School in Quincy, where he taught. And Mr. Mariano, as the kids still call him, uh, taught us that free meals mean so much to kids and families out there all across this state. A better focus on learning and a burden lifted from families. That's a good thing. Thank you all for getting that done. And we didn't stop there. Together, we provided record support for schools by fully funding the Student Opportunity Act. And this year, we're going to do it again. We, ex we expanded access to affordable health care. We paid off student loans for thousands of frontline health care workers. We increased financial aid to make state colleges and universities more affordable to our smart, hardworking Massachusetts students. This is what our work is supposed to be about, bringing help and bringing hope to those that we serve. Now, I still think of the grieving families I met at the Veterans Home in Holyoke. They lost loved ones to COVID in the cruelest way possible. So after one of the worst chapters in our state's history, we were determined to do right by our heroes. The legislature provided a plan and funding. The congressional delegation delivered. And we appointed our first ever cabinet level Secretary of Veterans Services, U.S. Army Reserves Major John Santiago to get the job done. In August, we broke ground on a new state-of-the-art facility that will provide the world-class care our veterans deserve. And in December, we opened an equally beautiful veterans home in Chelsea. We've started a new chapter, and we will never let our veterans down again. So now let's pass the HERO Act and make sure that all of our veterans get all the respect, all the services that they've earned. We've also faced some unexpected challenges. Now, I'm proud of the way Massachusetts stepped up with compassion and solutions for the influx of migrants that's testing states all around this country. This is a hard issue and one without easy answers. It's also not something that we created. But I want to be clear, while Massachusetts did not create this problem, we're going to continue to demand that Congress take action to fix the border to get us funding. We're also not waiting. We're showing a way forward. In November, we put on a work authorization clinic. And now, thanks to that, 3,000 of our new arrivals have work permits. Every day, every day, we're connecting them with businesses who need work, like Salem Hospital, that recently hired several migrants and now, for the first time in years, is fully staffed in their housekeeping custodial departments. We're going to do that all around this state, connect new arrivers with employers while we continue to advocate for Massachusetts.
Massachusetts met the moment in so many ways this past year. We started by standing up for reproductive rights, stockpiling mifepristone and protecting patients and providers in the face of national attacks. day to be a state where everyone can be safe and thrive. That means standing up for vulnerable communities with a new hate crimes unit in the state police, celebrating the first ever youth and family pride event right here at the state house, taking action, <laughs> taking action to close maternal health disparities with a first in the nation initiative delivering state services in more languages and with better digital access for people with disabilities, successfully implementing the Work and Family Mobility Act so that all residents, regardless of immigration status, can drive safely and legally to school or to work. We're turning climate change into opportunity with the appointment of the country's first cabinet-level climate chief and the first Green Bank dedicated to building healthy, affordable housing. And because justice can't wait, we pardoned 13 people in our first year in office, the first administration to do so in more than 40 years. We set high goals for our first year in office. I stood here a year ago and made a bunch of promises to you and to the Massachusetts public. And because we came together and we acted with urgency, we delivered results. We met every single one of those goals. Today, Massachusetts is more affordable, more competitive, more equitable than it was a year before. And the state of the Commonwealth, like the spirit of our people, is stronger than ever. And that's, that's what we're going to build on. That's the strength that we are going to build on this year. It's proof that we can do hard things. Nothing is impossible if we work together. I truly believe that Massachusetts is the best place in the world to live, to work, to go to school, to raise a family. But I also don't underestimate the challenges that we face. Costs are too high for housing and transportation. Our schools are the best but not for every student. Congested roads and slow trains steal our time and our joy. It's frustrating. And while many of our industries lead the world, the competition is only getting tougher. It's also true that as a state, we had several flush years with a lot of pandemic level funding from the federal government that now goes away. So we need to be smart with how we spend our money, your money. That's what we're going to do. The good news is that our economy and our fiscal health are strong. Our bond rating is excellent. Thank you, Treasurer Goldberg. And we have record amounts in the rainy day fund. The budget we file next week, I promise, will be balanced, responsible, and forward-looking. It will build on our progress, and we will take new steps to lower the cost of housing and child care, to strengthen our schools and support all our young people in reaching their potential, to get our roads and our rails moving, help our businesses and workers thrive, and meet the climate challenge by creating clean energy careers across our state. 
This is the work ahead of us, and there's no time to wait. It starts with housing, the biggest challenge we face. You know the numbers. Rents and prices are high. And here's what it looks like at a kitchen table. A young couple going on a real estate app, typing into Zillow their price range for a home, and seeing all of the homes disappear. Nothing available that they can afford. It's the recent graduates having dinner, talking about other states where their paycheck might go further. It's our seniors unable to think about downsizing because there's nothing to afford, or other seniors staring at disbelief at a letter from a landlord who's going to raise their rent. Now, this isn't just a few unlucky people. It's the heart of our workforce. It's the soul of our communities. It's the future of our state. So we have to act, and we have to act now, to make it easier for everybody to afford a place to live in Massachusetts. Last year, we appointed our state's first Secretary of Housing and Livable Communities. We tripled tax credits for new housing and increased low-income housing credits. We funded 1,000 new rental vouchers and identified surplus public land that could be turned into housing. These steps will make a difference. But we're dealing with a housing shortage that's decades in the making. To get costs down, we have to go big, and we have to go big now. That means passing our $4 billion Affordable Homes Act, which is the most ambitious housing plan in Massachusetts history. Because if you're born here, or you come to school here, I want you to be able to stay here. I want you to be able to grow a business, grow a family, and for businesses, I want you to be able to stay here, expand here, and I want you to be able to hire employees who can afford to live here. So let's work together. Let's get going. Let's pass this bill. Because when we do that, we will create middle-class housing and make home ownership a reality for families who've been priced out for far too long. We will build affordable homes at every income level and repair our long-neglected public housing. We will create supportive homes for seniors, veterans, people with disabilities. And we will support good construction careers with strong labor standards. Yeah. Here's what it can look like. We know what we have to do. We just have to do it. And here's what it can look like. Abelardo and Gabriella are here tonight from Haverhill with their two beautiful children. He works at a factory, and she's an early educator. They love Haverhill, and they wanted to buy their first home there. But with the prices, what they are, it didn't make sense. And they started looking at other parts of the country. Then they got connected with state programs that helped. And now they're homeowners in Haverhill. See. We know what we need to do. The Affordable Homes Act will create thousands of opportunities just like theirs. It would inject hundreds of millions of dollars into building programs and first-time homebuyer programs. It will reduce barriers to housing production and give communities the tools they need to develop housing where they need it. It will bring down housing costs for everyone. I'll be testifying tomorrow before the Joint Committee on Housing on the Affordable Homes Act, because passing it is our top priority. So let's work together and get it done. Because the truth is this. 
351 cities and towns. No town, no city can go it alone when it comes to housing. We have to work together. That's also why we're committed to helping towns meet the MBTA communities law. Because for Massachusetts to succeed, every community must embrace the opportunity that new housing affords. It's for the next generation to invest in their hometown, to help seniors age in place, to keep more talent and more customers fueling local businesses, to lower costs and unleash people's full potential. Now, housing is the biggest item for any family's budget, unless, of course, you have kids in childcare. <laughs> Costs have been too high for too long, while providers and care workers have been barely hanging on. It stresses families, it pushes women out of the workforce, it holds our economy back. We have to lower childcare costs. I know, we do. Otis is clapping. We do. You know, last year, we delivered nearly half a billion dollars in money to stabilize, right, the, the sector. And that was good. It made it easier for families to get financial help. This year's budget will keep that funding in place. But we need to go further. Yesterday, we were at the Y in Malden. We met some dedicated early educators and some very cute kids, did we not, Dr. Tutwiler? They were having fun and they were learning important skills in their pre-K classroom. It's an opportunity we want for every child. So here's what we need to do. It's our gateway to pre-K plan to save families money and transform early education in our state. First, we'll direct help to thousands of families by expanding eligibility for state financial assistance. In this program, child care costs are capped based on what you can afford. Next, we'll set a new goal for early education in Massachusetts. Let's have universal pre-K for every four-year-old in Massachusetts. Let's do it. Let's do it. To get there. To get there. I want, by 2026, a guaranteed access to high-quality, affordable preschool for every four-year-old in all 26 of our gateway cities. That means a seat in a classroom for over 23,000 children. But we won't stop there. We're going to keep working with businesses, with providers, and with the champions of child care in the legislature to get this done, to expand access to lower costs, and to meet this child care challenge. <laughs> by, every, by every metric, Massachusetts has the best schools in the country. But I want to talk about an urgent issue that we need to address. On last year's MCAS, a majority of our third graders were not meeting expectations in English language arts. That number reflects social inequities. It also reflects the fact that many districts are using out-of-date, disproven methods to teach reading. And our children are paying the price, some struggling for years to catch up if they even can. So we're changing that. Tonight, I'm announcing Literacy Launch. And over the next five years, backed by budget investments, here's what we want to do. We will make best reading materials available to more districts. Schools that are using the right materials now are seeing major gains. We can bring that impact to every single classroom. We'll also mandate that educator training programs teach evidence-based instruction. And we'll support our teachers in adopting best practices every step of the way. 
Massachusetts. We're home to the first public school, the first college, the first library, and I want us first in literacy. Every child, every child in this state needs to be able to read and read well. And we're going to work together to give them the tools to do just that. Now, meanwhile, our high school students are telling us that what they learn in school should help them get to where they want to go. So we'll keep growing our early college programs so you can go to high school and earn community college credits and college credits at the same time. We'll invest more in innovation pathways that provide hands-on, work-based learning while you're in school. That's going to connect our students to lifelong opportunities, whether college or skilled careers. And it's going to be great for our workforce and for our economy. I see every day so much strength in our young people, amazing young people around this state. But for too long, too many children and teens haven't felt OK. There's a crisis in youth mental health. It's hurting our young people. It's stressing parents and straining families. And we have to do everything we can to address that. Now, last year, we expanded school-based mental health support from early childhood to higher ed. We also launched 26 community behavioral health centers to provide urgent in-person crisis response around the clock. They've served thousands of children already. And in just one year, we've cut in half emergency room stays for youth mental health. That's real impact. So, we know what's working. So we're going to do more of it with support in school and in community. And for young people with the most complex needs, will address a serious gap in services. Our budget will call for $10 million to develop service models, including residential, that ensure the most vulnerable young people get the care they need and parents get support. Let's be a state where every young person knows that it's OK to sometimes not be OK. And we will help you. I want to thank. I want to thank Senate President Spilka for her profound leadership on this issue. She set us on the right path with the Mental Health ABC Act. She shared her family's own struggle with mental health, and in doing so, further helped to destigmatize what so many parents, what so many kids, what so many families have experienced at home. She also made sure, and I know I look forward to continuing to work to make sure that in this state, mental health is valued just as much as physical health. Thank you, Senate President. Transportation. Let's talk quality of life. Transportation affects everyone's quality of life every single day. That's why we've worked hard to fix roads and bridges and rails, to make them safer, to get them moving. We sent this year unprecedented funding, thank you, to cities and towns for locally needed projects. And we did more. We need state funding, of course. But I, as governor, want to make sure that we are going after and chasing and getting every single federal dollar that is out there for infrastructure and bringing it back to Massachusetts. So a year ago, a year ago, we created a federal funds and infrastructure office. We set up a team, we leaned in, we worked closely with communities to submit top-notch applications. 
and we brought home nearly $3 billion to Massachusetts in year one alone. That includes, that includes $24 million to rebuild Leonard's Wharf at the Port of New Bedford, $33 million for electric school buses, $108 million to advance West East passenger rail in Springfield, Pittsfield, Palmer, and Worcester. And we routed out the year by winning $372 million to begin, finally, rebuilding the Cape Cod Bridges. to our congressional delegation, our Mass Department of Transportation, and the federal funds team, not to mention the great communities of the Cape and across our state. There's much more to come, and we are going to continue to get after it every single day. For the MBTA, we appointed General Manager Phil Eng with deep operational experience. He's hard at work. He and his team are hard at work fixing the T. Now, when we took office, the T was badly underfunded, very poorly managed, and woefully understaffed. 1,100 vacancies alone a year ago. It's no surprise the trains weren't running on time. So we pledged to hire 1,000 new workers at the T. We got a good new labor contract to help recruit and retain more workers. And last year, the MBTA hired 1,500 new employees, the best year ever the T has had in hiring. Thank you to the Carmen's Union for your partnership. It's making a difference. It's making a difference. Slow zones are down. Stations are cleaner and more welcoming and accessible. Commuter rail ridership has been over 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels one of the very best marks in the country. And platforms, these commuter rail platforms in Lynn and, Ash, and Ashland, uh, there are a few out there, but in Lynn and Ashland, we opened those platforms ahead of schedule. Look, I know we've got a long way to go. I know that, and I want all our T riders out there to know that. I thank you for your patience as our work continues. But we are committed to making your commutes better. And I can share with you tonight, our budget proposal next week will offer transformative investments to improve all the ways that people get around in Massachusetts. We'll increase funding for local roads and bridges to record levels, with special investments dedicated to rural communities. We'll double our support for MBTA operations and tackle deferred maintenance so that we can build a system that is worthy of our economy. It is imperative. We'll also establish a permanent reduced fare for low-income T-riders and continue affordable options at regional transit authorities. Finally, to address the long-term needs of our rails and our roads, we'll appoint a task force of public and private leaders to chart a course forward for transportation financing in the clean energy era. You see, there are challenges, and there's a lot that needs doing. But I promise, under our administration, we aren't kicking the can down the road any longer on anything difficult. This year, this year ahead, we'll also put our new economic development plan into action. We're going to make it easier for companies of all sizes to do business here in Massachusetts. And we're going to seize new opportunities to grow, from a new tourism strategy to new workforce pipelines through our Mass Talent Initiative. I want things working and moving in our state. I want employees to look at our state and get excited. I want businesses, large and small, to grow and thrive. And I want every company out there to know that we are Team Massachusetts. We're aligned in values. We collaborate across business, government, higher ed, and nonprofits. 
Last year alone, we partnered well with industry to win a super competitive bid from the federal government. The Chips and Science Act was a program that was there to, to, to send funding out to states. And working together, Team Massachusetts, we submitted an application and we won the microelectronics hub for the country. That's a big deal. It's going to... It's going to accelerate advanced manufacturing and create great jobs all across our state. We also worked with life science and healthcare leaders to pitch and win a national hub in ARPA-H. ARPA-H, this is a big deal. America's medical discovery moonshot. It's going to drive investment through our economy. And it makes Massachusetts more likely to be the place where the next, where the next life-saving vaccine is produced, where world-changing cures for cancer, for Alzheimer's, for heart disease are going to come from. And it wasn't only our world-class science that won the day, which is something we all should be proud of. It was our commitment to making sure that those next medical breakthroughs reach everyone, no matter who you are or what you can pay. Tonight, I am honored that we are joined by Director Renee Wiggerson and the ARPA-H team, including health equity champion Gladys Vega, Stan Wang of Thymune, which is a Massachusetts company. It's a Massachusetts company that's already won funding for life-saving immune system therapies. Medical discovery has been our state's calling card and our economic engine. We're going to renew the life sciences initiative with a new investment for a new era of innovation. We'll lengthen our lead in this critical sector. But we're not going to stop with life sciences. We're going to go out and win another world-changing industry. We're going to make Massachusetts the climate innovation lab of the world. We'll help climate tech companies not just start in Massachusetts, but scale in Massachusetts, creating good jobs in the climate corridor we're building across our state. You can see it coming to life. I think about Commonwealth Fusion, a clean energy innovator started at MIT. It's now got 500 employees at Devon's alone. I think about Sublime Systems in Somerville, a startup bringing low carbon building materials and now 70 manufacturing jobs in Holyoke, working through a state partnership. This is great stuff. Our climate tech initiative will catalyze this growth into global leadership that benefits Massachusetts workers and communities and our economy. Already we're leaning the clean energy revolution just this month, Vineyard Wind, right off the coast of New Bedford, is sending power to the grid. <laughs> On its way. <laughs> On its way to being the biggest offshore wind farm in North America. I kid, but it's true. We can land scallops and megawatts at the same time. <laughs> We're aiming our sights high, as we should. This spring, we'll review proposals for new wind power that could equal up to 25% of our energy needs. And importantly, we're going to develop a workforce plan because the heroes of this revolution will be the electricians, the builders, the HVAC installers, and more. And that means... It's good. It's really good. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to work. We're going to work closely 
with organized labor, with industry, with vocational schools and community colleges. For example, just this year, we're going to fund a no-cost HVAC training at schools across the state. That's going to train, it is awesome, that's going to train more than 400 HVAC installers who are going to help us maintain heat pumps that help decarbonize our buildings. Good stuff. Clean energy. You see, clean energy is not just going to power our homes and cars. It is going to power opportunity. Opportunity and equity for workers in every part of this state. The truth is that our cities and towns are deeply impacted by climate change. We see it already. We saw it in the floods this summer. Heck, we saw it this weekend, the devastation, particularly on our coastlines. So many communities dealing with unprecedented damage. In August, I stood in the kitchen of a restaurant owner in North Andover who was cleaning up slop, watching years of hard work absolutely destroyed by a storm. A month later, I was with a homeowner in North Attleboro whose house took on six feet of water in 20 minutes. It was condemned before my eyes. And that was on a road that had never seen flooding before. That's what it looks like when old infrastructure meets today's storms. We have to protect our homes. We have to protect our businesses for the long term and right now. Our communities need help. Our residents deserve a better response. So we're going to increase funding to help cities and towns shore up riverbanks, fix failing dams, fix drainage systems, and plan for the future. And, and, and tonight, tonight we are proposing a permanent disaster relief resiliency fund. And I want to thank Senator Joe Comerford and Rep. Natalie Blay, who championed this idea. <laughs> Severe weather isn't going away anytime soon. So let's future-proof our communities and be ready when help is needed. Two hundred and fifty years ago, we started a revolution in Massachusetts. Our state launched the American experiment and changed the course of world history. You can feel it in this building. Just look around you. Paul Revere and Sam Adams laid the cornerstone of this very foundation. The 54th Massachusetts Regiment mustered just outside and marched down Beacon Street on their way to help end slavery and save our union. Martin Luther King Jr. stood right here in this well, right where I'm standing now, and said, quote, it is from these shores that a new nation conceived and liberty was born. And it must be from these shores that liberty is preserved. worked in each generation to make America's founding promise real for all our people. It's who we are. And it's why whatever happens in national politics, Massachusetts will defend democracy. And more than that, we will live democracy and we will show how it works. We're going to take on our toughest challenges by making sure that every voice is heard, every community is listened to and that every step, trying as it may be, we take together. We know times aren't easy, but you know what? 
Writing a state constitution that became the model for this country wasn't easy. Winning a civil war wasn't easy. Bringing forth civil rights, universal health care, marriage equality wasn't easy, but we did it. And we can do it again. We can do it again. We're going to take on housing and child care by working with urgency and putting people first. We're going to spark new revolutions in healing people and protecting our planet. We're going to redouble our commitment to freedom and justice for all. And once again, we will be a beacon of hope for America and the world to follow. God bless you, and God bless the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts.